Next speaker is, uh, is, is Ernie Tate speaking on memoir as, as working class uh, political history. Um, his, uh, uh, he's written uh, two volumes, uh, the first one entitled Revolutionary Activism in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, Canada 1955 to 1965, and the second volume is entitled Britain uh, 1965 to 1970. Um, and I must say that, um, you know, apart from, you know, a long period of, of uh, you know, activism uh, in Britain as part of the, uh, of the IMG, and, uh, you know, helping to organize and lead the Vietnam Solidarity uh, campaign. Um, I, I just want to, uh, you know, make my one brief personal commentary, um, which is results from watching him speak on a, on a YouTube video. Oh. And, <laughs> and, 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 as how I some, the internet. <laughs> and as someone who has worked on working class intellectuals, it was really, it, it was a really striking experience because in spite of the, you know, the hundred year difference between your activism and the activism of some of the working class intellectuals that I have studied, um, I, I could see, you know, there were similarities, right, in, in the, you know, in, in, in the cadence of the voice and the, and the you know, I, it, it really reminded me of, you know, that if you grow up poor and working class in Belfast or grow up poor and working class in Salford like Bill Pritchard did, right, that there's, there are, whatever the ideological differences that you may have had with him, right, that, that, that there's, a, you know, there's a certain experience and understanding there. And, um, you know, I was reminded of, of Arthur Mould coming to Toronto in 1905, expecting to have a much better life for his family and walking the streets of Toronto and going, holy shit, things are the same here, right? It's not different, right? And I think, I just wanted to say, um, you know, and I hope I don't steal anything that you're going to say, but I think it's so important for us Keep on going. <laughs> so important on this topic of, of how do we revivify the left to, to keep, set, you know, um, I'm biased because of the work I've done, but the focus on how and why workers come to revolutionary consciousness, right? What, why, why do people become Ernie Tate's and other people get swallowed up by consumerism? And so you were, it was, it was great, you know, to, to see you and I'm really looking forward to hearing you again. <laughs> you get around to reading the book, you'll discover, I say, that's a contingency. Very often a contingency. Uh, well, well, thank you very much for the remarks. I, I don't consider myself an intellectual. I never have. I've been merely uh, an activist in the movement over my time. Uh, I think, I look around this room, it's one of the few times I can honestly say, I'm the oldest person here. <laughs> I'm not boasting about that. But uh, used to be at one time I'd be in meetings, gatherings, I'd be the youngest person there, now I'm the oldest. And one of the things I can do is talk about our history, where we come from, what we've done. Uh, but look, for, before I get into that, let me, let me say I consider it an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, uh, thank you, Brian, for, for inviting me. Uh, Brian and I have had our differences in the past. We have argued with each other. That's neither here nor there. But he embodies that quality of person who, despite differences, can be objective, especially when he's supporting your, support your book. <laughs> no, he can, he can uh, still have that discussion, and, uh, and uh, he, he's very much that kind of person. You see it. You see it in his two books. Uh, one book, the canon book, I'm not going to talk about the actual content of the book, but I'm going to talk about his, his method. Uh, I was struck, I, I, was, I knew a lot about canon, and I had met canon several times in my life, and I thought I knew him. When I read the book, I was absolutely fascinated. Not so much because there was a lot of new information, that was a revelation to me, a revelation to me. But also I was struck by Brian's method, his independence of view, which did not let him, uh, his argument to a certain extent with canon in certain parts of the book, there's a, a dialogue going there, 
But it's very clear we, we see that. It's not masks. It's, it's not presented in a way that distorts it. It lets you, the reader, see that, uh, that you can make your own judgment and those arguments. And I was uh, very struck by that. That was a revelation. Uh, let me say, the only other person I've read recently on an entirely different subject is Linda Gordon, a very important American feminist, book on Dorothea Lyme. An incredible book, which I think she was learning at Brian's feet. Because the methodology, the methodology is, is the same. It's that new, a certain integrity to it, which is very important. So, so much. That's, uh, let me say that. Now, when Brian got in touch with touching me, he said to me, he really was very busy organizing this, and he didn't have much time. And finally I got a note from him saying, what's the title? Of, put down the title of your talk. And I said, Jesus, what am I going to say? So I said, Memoirist History. Sounds fancy, Memoirist History. Really what I meant was, mem Memoir is a contribution to history. Because uh, that's how I tend to think. When I was working on the book, that's how I tended to think of what I was doing. Uh, I began writing the project but, uh, a few years ago. And what I was really trying to do, and, and in, as accurate in this sense, I was, I was seeing memoir as living history. We've had a lot of discussion here today about written history. What is a living history like? And only the people who really participate in that history tell us that. I'm not suggesting it's the end of the story, because we need the historians to come in and see where it's accurate. Because when I was writing the memoir, it's extremely selective. I, you select a theme. There are certain things you're going to highlight. There are certain things you're going to write. You try to be as truthful and accurate as possible to the record. But you're selecting, selecting the history. And being human, we leave things out. And I have to say up, up front, there's a, quite a few mistakes. I get the founding of the, of the, founding of the first international wrong by two years. <laughs> How that happened, the fact checking was very poor. Jess and I blame each other, <laughs> etc. We blame others. But there's facts like that, uh, and, and they have been brought to my attention. So if we ever bring out a second volume, We'll correct those. Now, the other reason why uh, I, I wrote this is because, one, there's nothing much on the Canadian movement, as I'm right, what its pra practical history was. There's nothing much. And in fact, what I have found over the years is Canadian, the Canadian revolutionary movement does not exist for the rest of the world. I'm telling you. It doesn't, doesn't exist. People don't know about it. Don't know what we did, especially in Britain. Especially in Britain. They don't know what this movement was, what we've accomplished. In fact, about Canada generally, there's not much uh, knowledge. Frank, that's how I found it. So I saw the need, I saw the need to try and, and present what we have done the group I was involved in, what I was in, to try and present that, and pre and, uh, present that picture and elaborate it. Because <coughs> it's not even that well known in the United States. So as a result, when the memoir came out, several people got in touch with me and said, I didn't know this history at all. I could tell you who they were. They were big. They thought they knew Canada. They thought they knew Canada. And then uh, one of them said to me, one of them wrote and said, you should have included a map to show where every, every was, where everywhere it was. Should have had that in the front. <laughs> yes. But anyway, there's a knowledge. But people got back and said they didn't know what the Canadian movement is. So this is a contribution not only to us here in Canada, but also to the United States, radicals in the United States, to know that we had a vibrant movement here and we achieved very important things. And also to talk about what we accomplished. That's important. What did we accomplish? What were, what were our effects? One of the longest chapters I write about is the uh, 
uh, by Cuba and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Uh, this was a very interesting experience, uh, a very important experience on the Canadian left after the Cuban Revolution. The Americans, the American Fair Play, Fair Play Cuban Committee has got a lot of coverage. It existed for about two years. It did some very important work, but the Fair Play for Cuban Committee lasted for about 10 years, and it did some incredible work. And so I used this, uh, I, I used this opportunity to talk about that experience and fill it out a bit. Now, one of the, the group I was in at the time was named the Socialist Educational League. That was a small left group. And in the memoir, I try and do something that I think is important, because I've heard it said here today, it's about numbers. Quantify what are the facts in some detail. I, I talk about numbers in the organization, how many were there. I talk about how we lived, what money we had, we got, someone got in touch with me from the United States and said, I didn't realize you guys were so poor. Because we lived, we're a working class organization. And we, if you could imagine, we lived uh, the, uh, the wage, what's the, um, the, the minimum wage we would, we would have considered high mm -hmm. if we had jobs. But that was the general character of the movement. But what happened in Canada was very par powerful as the Americans began to mobilize against it. Very powerful voices were raised in Canada to cut off trade with Cuba. Uh, Senator Kroll, a liberal uh, senator, one of the most powerful voices, urging Diefen Baker to cut off, uh, cut off the aid to Cuba. So that's when we began the process of looking around to see how we could build, carry out some defense work. And let me say, we were able to do this because of a political change in the country. And it was a very slight change, but a very important one. Because you have to remember, the period I'm talking about was the period of McCarthyism. Social, social, the word socialism was anathema. You couldn't talk. When I came from uh, Belfast to here, I was struck by the, the terrible, you could not say the word socialism. You'd be isolated. It was a, a very suffocating political atmosphere. The left was narrow, very small, very small. And so you're always looking for a, for a break, some opening. But it was very, very difficult. But a break, what happened is the mood began to change. And it that began to change around the attitude, I'd like to say, of anti-imperialism in the country. That would be a glorification of the name. Of a certain anti-Americanism Americanism that developed. And it was crystallized. It's, when I look back on it, I didn't necessarily have this view at the time. When I look back on it, I saw it in the pipeline debate, a very important debate in the country which is, uh, you should pay attention to, because we experienced that debate and what was happening in the country directly, because I happened to be on uh, one of our vanguard, we call them vanguard tours, where we went across the country on a truck, and we tried to talk to people about socialism and sell the paper and things like that. I happened, we happened to be out in the prairies when this thing was unfolding, and an election, the first election was called uh, the 70, the 56 election where Diefenberger uh, got a minority in government. In the build up to that election, Diefenberger was organizing meetings with 10, 15,000 people at them on the prairies around the question of the pipeline because the, there was a uh, tremendous anger in the country because Lehman Brothers, along with the Liberal government, was proposing organizing a pipeline around the, uh, along the north that would have brought gas down into the United States and excluded Western Canada. That was, that was the proposal. And there was uproar. 
And that led to the defeat of the Liberal government in 76. They were swept out of power. This was the natural ruling government of Canada. Been in power for, often, for a very long time. And now the Tories took over. With that came a, 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 a a mood of criticism of the United States. So when the Cuba, Cuba revolution take pla took place and the Americans began their campaign to, to boycott the country, there, there was a feeling of, uh, feeling of resentment. About, I'm not saying extensive, I'm not saying, but in certain layers of the population, people resented this small country being kicked around and that. Elementary by this large country. So that was an opening that allowed us to sort of uh, talk to people. So we launched a fair play for Cuba Committee, and I'll briefly go over some of the things we did, uh, our successes. We had some of the uh, first thing we did is we organized uh, tours to Cuba. Al Purdy, poets, intellectuals went to Cuba. Uh, we publicized those, we organized uh, student tours to go to Cuba. <coughs> uh, at, a, at a critical, at a very important point, very, very early. This wasn't because, and this, we weren't, this wasn't all our work, I'm, what I'm saying to you. There's one very important development which we were involved in, and that was in the, in the, in the BC Federation of Labor, when at its annual convention, some of our people, delegates, others, the Communist Party included, I must say, we got the, uh, we got the, uh, the, the, the Congress to come out against the United States. And not only that, they voted to send their total staff and officers of, of, the, of the Federation down to Cuba to visit it. Now, there was big hostility within the labor movement, the CLC opposed that, opposed that. But that was a very important development. We, we played a, uh, an enormous role. Uh, we helped. I would like to say we did it, but I'm, I, that, that wouldn't be that good. The second volume of the, of, the, of the memoir deals with Britain. And I went there in 1965. I was Basically, it was an, ass an assignment I took to go to Britain from Canada, help a little uh, small grouping, in, uh, mainly concentrated. There's a comrade here from Nottingham. He's here. I heard him speak. He said he was from Nottingham. I went there to help uh, a, little, a grouping of ours, which was a, little, a grouping that supported the Fourth International, and that was Ken, Ken Coates, Tony Topham, and Pat Jordan, uh, who were functioning in the Labour Party, and were a group that was sympathetic to the Fourth International. And so uh, the Fourth International asked if the Canadian could send someone, so I took the assignment. And I was followed there by a group of other Canadians. They came, became a very attractive place to go politically. And so other comrades of mine went, not, not many, five or six went there. But anyway, I, w I went there at that time. And it was a small organization, had done some work in the Labour Party, some influence. Probably uh, Ken Coates would have been the best known intellectual we had. He was active in, the, uh, active in the Labour Party at that time, had come out of the Communist Party. And he would have been regarded as part of the New Left, very much. And he may have even at one time considered himself in that way. But anyway, I began to work with them. And very quickly, over a very short period of time, we organized a, group, a grouping in London. And we began to think of what we could do about, about Vietnam. Bertrand Russell Tribunal on the Vietnam War. Uh, this was, at the time, this was a major event <coughs> comprised of the, some of the major major intellectuals in the world, and it set about to organize a, uh, a tribunal, not to judge uh, the American government's policies in, in Vietnam, but to cast a moral judgment, if I can say that, in that sense. 
this was a very important activity, and Russell made a very, uh, I consider a major contribution. We were instrumental. We provided him with forces that allowed, that allowed him to do that. And it had a big, big effect. Uh, there's no, nothing much the left does that, uh, that can resist the American imperialism when it wants to shut you down. And the Americans, very much, American State Department, very much wanted to shut us down. They banned us in France. They banned us from meeting uh, through its influence in Britain. They banned us other places. Stopped us. We finally met in Sweden and had a couple of a couple of sessions there. But every day, uh, and this is uh, true in several, uh, uh, it can be seen in several biographies of Lyndon Johnson. Every they say one biographer says, every morning he got up, he would ask, "What's this asshole Russell doing now?" or something to that effect. <laughs> something to that effect, because. What they, what they realized and what we realized, that this moral judgment we were making on the Americans uh, against the American imperialism was a very powerful thing to do. Anyway, those are my remarks. Thank you very much.